From our studios here as Rich in Accra, the Equia of Wahima Studio, on DSTV Channel 277, uh, and across all social media platforms on Facebook and YouTube at Metro TV Guy, on Twitter and Instagram at Metro TV GH. I am Bright, the Nakwe C. I'm coming up in the next 60 minutes. Ongoing strike by some key staff of the University of Development Studies begins to bite as it entered day three. Stakeholders have been holding back-to-back -back crunch meetings for a resolution. We'll tell you more. International Youth Day celebrated, however, marked with a boycott by the opposition National Democratic Congress, the NDC, over prevailing economic hardship, but an honor for President Kufuado as he's conferred with a special award by the youth in the country. In a bizarre twist, a student nurse threatens to kill a client who may come to her facility for treatment because she was coerced by her family to study nursing. To some good news, Ghana's last Marbeck case test negative. And also on the international front, Mozambican government makes recording of accident or disaster scenes before notifying emergency services unlawful with offenders to be liable for a fine of 125 US dollars. And thank you so much for joining us here on the news this evening. First in the bulletin tonight, the President of Ghana and the Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Forces, Nana Adudankwa Ekufuado, has retreated his commitment towards equipping the forces to deal with contemporary threats in the region. According to him, specialized units, among others, have been created um, to enhance operations across the northern borders. He said this at the Ghana Military Academy 2022 graduation parade. The Ghana Military Academy, since its establishment, has produced over 3,500 Ghanaian officers. While some have retired, others are still serving in various capacities. Speaking at this year's graduation ceremony, the President of Ghana, Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, said, Government has approved the expansion of the Ghana Armed Forces to address security threats in the region. We are determined to equip our armed forces to deal with the contemporary threats in the region, as well as other internal security challenges, and contain security threats from violent extremist and terrorist groups along our northern borders. To this end, additional bases, specialized units, and brigades have been created with the acquisition of requisite equipment to enhance operations, particularly along our northern frontier. He further urged the new officers to be guided by the principles of duty in guarding the interests of the state. You are expected to play a critical role in helping to guarantee the territorial integrity and the development of the nation. I urge you to be guided by the principles of duty service, sacrifice and selflessness in safeguarding the interest of the state, which should always be paramount throughout your entire career. He added that Ghana has succeeded the UN target of having 15% female serving in the military by 2018. I'm proud to state that Ghana has already exceeded the UN target for the year 2028 of 15% female formed troops and 25% female MILOVS staff officers. As presently, we have already deployed 15% female formed troops and as high as 36% MILOVS staff officers. Reporting for Metro News, Rosemary Anyingba Accra. If security and safety is assured, there will be a brighter day coming for the people of Lua Minya and Yulu Krobo. 
This was what Sichua, the ECG PRO of the Tema branch of which the communities fall under, has stated. The power outages in Lower Menya and Yilo Kobo has in the past two weeks brought severe confrontations with the Electricity Company of Ghana. When the power distribution involved the military during the installation of prepaid meters, cases of alleged brutalization and loss of lives were leveled against ECG and the military. Therefore, the ECG together with the Paramount Chiefs and National Security have reached an agreement to restore power to the two affected municipalities through a roadmap. Speaking to the ECG PR of the Tema branch, Sichua Menta, she said ECG has been lenient enough. That's the need for this stringent measure. If some people would really just hear ECG when we talk, they would realize that aside the threatening behavior, we've also made quite a, a number of concessions. For instance, if you owe ECG, you have just about four months to pay. And in the four months, you are supposed to pay 70% as your first installment, then 10, 10, 10 over the next three months. So four months, that's all you have. However, for the customers in the Krobo district, we have given them 60 months, five years, to pay off their debt from 2018 to 2021. There's been instances where some of them has, have been saying that we had issues of overbilling and we kept overbilling them. There were also issues of underbilling, but we are not hearing that. Some customers were underbilled because we had a software challenge in 2016. We deployed a new software. For emphasis sake, this software was deployed in all of ECG operational areas. All of ECG operational areas. And going by the 10 old regions, we operate in Ashanti, Eastern, Western, Central, Greater Accra, and Volta regions. This software was deployed in all of these areas. And we had the same challenge across board. So there were customers who were overbilled, there were customers who were underbilled. ECG was able to rectify all of this for all our customers. MC of Yilo Corbo, Eric Tete, however, says they are excited that the ECG will soon restore power to the community. Though we have some few uh, people who were agitating based on uh, uh, an information that somebody told them, which most of us believe was, wasn't true, that there was uh, an MOU which uh, uh, said that after 50 years, uh, upon the building of the Akosomo Dam, mm -hmm. people who were affected uh, should not pay life bill. Uh, mm -hmm. And so some people believed in that. But I can tell you, majority of the people, the good people of Kroboland, uh, didn't believe in that. We've checked everywhere, and we have asked them that if they had anything like that, they should bring it up for, uh, for, for, for redress, but there's nothing like that. She further said they are looking out for stabilization of security in the area. If you have a brother who works with ECG, Krobo District, your brother tells you, I'm going to work, see you later in the evening. During the day, ECG management calls you. We have bad news for you. How would you feel? We need to protect your brother's life if he's a staff of ECG. His life is as critical as any other life. It's an issue of security, safety, monitoring and patrolling of our, uh, our network to ensure its integrity before power supply. If we are not assured of the health status of our network, we cannot we, can, we cannot supply. The privilege of electricity supply will soon reach the communities of Lower Menya and Yilokobo. The Senior Staff Association of the Universities of Ghana, Ghana Association of University Administrators and the Tertiary Education Workers Union of Ghana declared an indefinite strike last Wednesday. The action was against the management of the University of Development Studies, Tamale. And among other things, the workers noted that, one, failure to pay July 2022 salaries of staff on time without any communication to staff, which is the best managerial practice, or true and fair leadership. Failure to widely engage all the relevant stakeholders, unions in what is believed and considered to be an ambush migration of the salaries of staff to the controller and accountant general mechanized payroll system without any agreed document, MOU, from controller as agreed in previous engagements. The president, with regard for prudent administrative procedures that naturally affect unity, transparency, and peaceful institutional environment to propel 
the attainment of UDS vision and mission, staff welfare and institutional well-being. Also, the penchant of leadership for disrespect and dislike and disinterest in working with labor unions to drive the developmental agenda of the institution and many more administrative and academic practices that put UDS at a very high risk position. And so we are now joined on phone by Abdul Hai Mumen, who is a public relations officer for the University of Development Studies. Good evening to you and welcome to this night. Thank you very much. I'm now, grateful for this opportunity. So how is the university's management addressing the concerns of the staff? First of all, I need to say that some of the adjectives that have been used in your intro are a bit too strong, mm. considering the reality on the ground. Um, I do admit that at some point, some persons from within the university may have issued a statement, a statement that used some of the adjectives that you use, but the uh, environment and the ambience around the campus today does not reflect some of the, the, the adjectives, very strong adjectives that have been used in your intro this evening. Having said that, I must also say that um, the issues you have enumerated have been so many, I, I, as you read them, I counted about six or seven, but in essence, when you uh, summarize those issues, you come down to two critical and basic issues. These two critical issues that have been raised by the unions that you referred to, and indeed, there are four major unions across all universities, and uh, three of these unions within the University for Development Studies Enclave uh, are the ones who have uh, these concerns. And the concerns, as I've already mentioned, can be uh, summarized into two. First being delays in the payment of salaries for the month of July. And I want to underline this, without communication to the relevant unions. That's number one. And then number two being the migration of the salaries and the processing of salaries onto the controller and accountant general's payroll. These, uh, from where I sit, are the two major concerns by the unions. Mm. And indeed, uh, there have been, as, as of today, there were extensive engagements between management and the leadership in particular of the, the three unions that you referred to. Uh, management did apologize to the unions for the delay, for the lack of communication, which is what really caused this problem and not particularly because of the delays uh, and, and uh, assured the unions that uh, subject to some discussions that the controller and accountant general's department had with the University for Development Studies as well as all the relevant stakeholders including these unions that are currently striking, uh, the, the, the engagement in 2020 uh, came to an end inconclusively because uh, the UDS staff, those who are on strike now, had certain concerns that they wanted the controller and accountant general's department to address before they are migrated onto its payroll. Some of these concerns uh, included the fact that they wanted an interface mm. to be established on the campus of the University for Development Studies, an interface that would process the salaries and just give the information for uh, clarification and any other queries to be raised by the, the, the controller and accountant general. And if this was done and they were sa satisfied, then the payment would continue. Uh, these, among other concerns, were raised. However, according to these unions, uh, those concerns had not been addressed. One of the other concerns mm. was that before being migrated, the unions insisted on seeing an MOA, a memorandum of understanding between an um, MOA, not MOU rather, uh, between the, 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 the universities and the, the unions, as well as the controller and accountant general, stating particularly all the concerns they had raised and how the uh, controller and accountant general's department was going to raise this and so i was going to address those problems and uh, according to them they haven't heard anything from the controller and accountant general 
and yet indications are that uh, they had already been put on that payroll. And um, as of, uh, I can tell you that as of this morning and late last night, some staff had begun receiving their salaries. So the issue of delayed salaries really had already been resolved long before uh, we, we started talking uh, right. uh, during this interview. So yes, the, right. the issue has likely been addressed. Mm. And, and when are you returning to the classrooms? Uh, that's the issue. So after the, the, the no, so the point is, as for the classrooms, so those in charge of, uh, you know, it's UTAC, the University Teachers Association, who deal directly with students, who teach them, who supervise the examinations. A majority of the students are on vacation as we speak. Uh, a large chunk of the university students, a second year, as well as uh, some third year students are on what we call the third trimester field practical program. And so, um, really, this strike hasn't directly affected academic work because UTAC, as we speak, has not declared a strike. However, those three other associations and unions who have declared a strike, uh, after the meeting with management, have also called for some meetings with their members, so they relay uh, the outcome of the meeting with management to them, and it is only after that that if the strike will be called off, they will make that announcement to us, and we will make you know uh, what the agreements were and uh, whether or not they will call off the strike mm. on Monday. All right. Thank you for time with us here. I'm Abdul Hayi Moumen, who uh, he is the public relations officer for the University of Development Studies in Tamale. Away from that, let's still uh, speak to, uh, to this issue and have a conversation with the senior staff. Um, I want to find out what exactly it means for them. I want to find out concerns have been raised by the, according to the salaries and the payment um, delay and all that. Why are they even still going on strike in as much as the salaries have been paid, even though a delay that will be joining on phone um, very soon by a senior staff, Zakaria, to help me talk about this um, particular problem. Why are they on strike, even though they free their salaries? They are saying that they delayed, and some of the issues that were raised by them, according to them, is that another concern they raised was about the penchant of leadership for disrespect and dislike and disinterest in working with labor unions to drive the rental <laughs> agenda. And also, there is also allegation of an ambush migration of salaries of staff to the controller and accountant general mechanized payroll system. We're bringing more on that as we are trying to reach Zachariah, who is a senior staff, on this particular matter. But for now, away from this, for now, we have Zachariah on phone for this conversation. Good evening to you, sir. Welcome to this night. Good evening to Metro TV and good evening to our care listeners. And thank mm. you for having me. Great. Now, why these concerns if your salaries have been paid? Do it delayed. Islam, um, why we have uh, had uh, a delay in salary very unusually, and uh, after the term of uh, this man, we were not paid. Hmm. So the uh, unions took the initiative to go and engage with our vice chancellor to find out what was responsible for the delay in the payment of the July 2022 salaries only for us to be told by him that um, he doesn't owe us any explanation. He's in charge and he pays salaries without consulting union. And um, if salary is, <laughs> we should shut up. And added that we have been migrated to controller and accountant general payroll without um, a recourse to um, any staff. And we thought this was very bad. So the cause of delay in the salary is largely due to the fact that we have been uh, somehow ambushed to the controller and accountant general payroll system. Mm. Because there were certain structures that were supposed to have been put in place, which we earlier on raised on the 18th of January 2021, when the vice chancellors invited the, all the unions to the vice chancellors uh, secretariat in Accra. They pulled out an MOE that was signed somewhere in 2017. And the MOE sought to uh, say that the controller accountant general was going to create what they call an interface. This was a system that was going to allow universities of, uh, I mean, uh, public universities in Ghana to still be doing the inputting of their um, uh, salaries. And now send it through, uh, 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 through a media, uh, uh, through some medium that they call uh, electronic medium. So we thought that was it, but we indicated to the vice chancellor that our engagement with the controller accountant general didn't point out to 
And in addition to that, the Controller Accountant General had gone around all the six public universities in Ghana and did what they call sensitization. Now, during this sensitization, we detected a lot of challenges and enumerated them to the Controller and Accountant General, which he admitted that, yes, these were legitimate concerns and that you are going to get back mm. to us on the strategy uh, he's going to use to address it. Mm. Only that for us to um, report the matter to the National Labor Commission on that same day, 18th January 2021. So the National Labor Commission, we turned in the evidence of the agreement that was signed between Vice Chancellor's Ghana and the Controller Accountant General. And the question was put to the Controller Accountant General, whether it was uh, the case of migration or interface. In fact, President at that meeting was the Deputy Director of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. He didn't miss words. The controller mentioned that it was a pure migration. So we um, realized that there was some kind of contradiction. While the MOE with the Vice Chancellor were interface, <laughs> the controller presentation was migration. Mm. When he was pushed further, what he said was that, well, he's going to allow the universities to run the system for three months, and they will eventually uh, pull out everybody onto the controller of the general payroll system. Mm. Now, Zakaria, we, we just had a conversation with the Moomin, who is the PR for the University of Development Studies, and he says that a number of the problems you've raised is being fixed, and some of them have already been fixed. Tell me, what are some of these problems that are yet to be fixed? Um, in fact, uh, today, uh, our management invited the unions, and we went. First of all, the, the management took the opportunity to apologize to us and alluded to the fact that, yes, they needed to have done a, a, a broader consultation mm. with staff. And that was in error. And they apologized profusely. Now, what is outstanding as we speak, some members of staff have not yet uh, gotten a let. They've checked through their accounts, they cannot see it. Some members, uh, some, some, some staff of the University for the World States have been overpaid. While some have been underpaid as, mm. as much as 1,000, 2,000, and some as low as 95 Ghana City. These issues have not been resolved. It hasn't been resolved at all. So none of the problems that we have faced uh, probably emanating from the the ambush migration has been resolved to the best of my knowledge. We met with management. Mm. So I don't know what you are is talking about. We are, we, we are there, we were there <laughs> with management. And all the issues that we speak, our pages are hot. Mm. So and I, it is very difficult to say that we, I mean, management pleaded that we should suspend the strike. But we found it extremely difficult when we went to consult with our members. So while they were not being paid, the reason for which we are striking, <laughs> what will motivate us I mean, to convince our members to suspend, I mean, to allow us as a citizen to suspend the strike. Mm. That so doesn't, mean, does it, doesn't mean you're not suspending your strike until all the problems are solved. Yeah, you see, we are talking about issues. One, the delayed salary, which has been paid in error, error has not been resolved. Two, we were expecting that there would have been a policy document behind the migration, stating clearly the form and nature the migration is going to be. And stating clearly again, the challenges that we envisage and raised previously, how it was going to be addressed. And thirdly, we're expecting that there would have been a time frame for the investment management and controller accountant general to do proper planning, to avert the experience our members are currently going through. That has not been done. So the frustration of staff so far as 2022, um, July, Clarice are concerned, is growing. People are, people are willing. Zakaria, people Zakaria are what I want to find out here tonight is that, is a strike still in session or you've called okay. it off? On authority, I can tell you so that as we speak, the strike is still in full force. We haven't suspended it. Our members are not satisfied. They are frustrated. The tension is so high. They have, in fact, we, we, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it, but the strike is still in full force, to the best of my knowledge, as the chairman of the Senior Staff Association of the University for Development Studies. All right, thank you for telling us here tonight.
Thank and you I have so been speaking time. with Zachariah, who is a senior staff uh, member. We've been talking about issues facing staff and workers of the University of Development Studies in Ghana. We'll bring you more update on that later. But away from that for now, headquarters popularly known as Kayaye have bemoaned the decline in sales and patronage of their work. This follows the consistent increase in prices of goods and commodities in Ghana. Shadrach or Damir Jari have been speaking to headquarters in Central Business District. Ghana's inflation has hit a record high of 31.7%. This is the highest level in the last two decades. Prices of food and other goods are rising daily, worsening living conditions for ordinary consumers. Many citizens have lamented the skyrocketing cost of living, with the latest to wait in being headquarters, popularly known as Kayaye. These headquarters narrated how inflation has affected their businesses. We are unable to make sales, talk less of saving for ourselves. Because of the surge in prices, people do not employ our services. My seven children and I feed on my 20 CD per day hustle. I make less than 50 CDs a week. I spend what I get on expensive bathroom and toilet services. The rest, I spend on food. We go into the day non-expectant. The increase in prices has pulled customers away. For Ama, selling of fruits was her only escape in getting extra income. She was, however, quick to add that she is struggling to stay in business due to the high cost of the fruits. Mangoes, among other fruits, have become so expensive, we are unable to make others eat them. These are the stories of headquarters here in Makwala. People have had to... We'll bring more from that story. Still to come after the break, a student nurse is threatening to kill her client when she eventually completes school and starts working. The realities of this story, stay with us, don't go anywhere. I don't want to be a nurse, but my family said I should study nursing. So now start working, and any patient who comes to meet me at this hospital should run away or I'll kill them. Welcome back to News Night Live from Astrosia Arts Region Accra. Now, a lady believed to be a nursing student at the Tamil Nurses Training College has threatened to kill patients who visit her health facility because, according to her, she was forced by a family to study nursing. In a TikTok video which has since gone viral, the lady is heard speaking in her native Wali language while issuing the threats. I don't want to be a nurse, but my family said I should study nursing. So now start working, and any patient who comes to meet me at this hospital should run away or I'll kill them. And we have been trying to reach the necessary stakeholders and authorities to speak on this, but it's proven futile. We're to follow up on that and bring a more update as to how they react to this video coming in from the nurse there in Tamale. Away from that, a 15-year-old boy, Kwejo Imaho, is a first-year student of Agogo State SHS, has committed suicide at Ebuakwa DKC in the Chuma in Wabija, South Municipal of the Ashanti region. 
According to the source, the incident was uncovered at around 4 p.m. today, August 12, 2022. Grandmother of the deceased, Madame Ochre Dakua Rebecca, who spoke with the media, confirmed that she really doesn't know why her grandchild hanged himself. The body of Kojo Ima has been conveyed by the Ibuakwa police who have sent it to the Ibuakwa Polyclinic for autopsy and further investigation. We will later be joined by our reporters there in the region for more updates on that particular story. Now, an official of the United Nations Information Center in Accra has tagged the youth of the country to take up opportunities which will challenge them to become better individuals. Speaking at the commemoration of this year's National Youth Day, Cynthia Pura mentioned that the youth play an important role in our society, hence the need to ensure they are well grounded for the various tasks ahead. Ghana CSO's platform, a United Nations in Ghana observed the National Youth Day on Friday. The program, which was under the theme Engaging Young People for Intergenerational Solidarity, the roadmap for achieving the SDGs, saw many enlightened panelists sharing varied opinions on how the youth can develop themselves. Some of the issues raised at the event included the youth and ageism, as well as how to cultivate habits that will resort into generational solidarity. The youth were also tasked to show interest in the Sustainable Development Goals and find ways to further those causes to effect changes around them and the world as a whole. Metro TV spoke to the Executive Director of Young Visionary Leaders Ghana, Joseph Tete Afangbe, organizer of the program. We believe that going forward, young people should be given equal opportunity to, to also be able to, you know, exhibit or show what they can do to develop our nation and also make an impact when it comes to the global level. They had a National Information Officer of the United Nations Information Center in Accra, Cynthia Pra, shared her views on the youth's involvement in politics. For the youth of Ghana, um, we know that the youth constitutes about 36% of the national population. And so this is a very significant number, uh, meaning so much is within the youth that we can tap into. Um, we've heard over the years how the youth is very resourceful. They are very innovative, and so there's a need for us to listen to them and to invite them to the decision-making table and even let them remain there so that they also contribute to the process of development. I'm still staying with that. President Ekufwara says youth development remains at the heart of his government's agenda at this year's International Youth Day celebrations at Mampon. He said the free TV for all, one district, one factory initiative, and the youth start program, which will all soon be rolled out nationwide, are all aimed at providing opportunities for the youth. Young people are willing to risk everything to improve their circumstances. We've seen in recent times high numbers of them taking harrowing risks around the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean, trying to reach the mirage of a better life in Europe. What this means is that if we provide them the right environment in Africa, they will make our continent great. If these youth are encouraged to spend their considerable energies at home, Africa could experience huge economic gains. Increasing investment in young people is key. This includes promoting quality education that prepares them for a future of opportunities. A diversity of training will be needed from quality primary and secondary schools to technical and vocational training schools to teacher training colleges to research intensive universities. For young people to be able to exploit the economic opportunities that abound in Africa, they must have the skills and training necessary to take advantage of them. In doing this, 
Africa must fashion an education policy that is also gender sensitive, for women are a majority of the African population. It is for this reason that since assumption of the high office of president in 2017, my government has placed great importance on guaranteeing access to a minimum of senior high school education for all Ghanaian children by the free senior high school policy. And still on that, the youth wing of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, boycotted the celebration of uh, the National Youth Day here in Ghana due to what they call economic hardship the country is going through, brought upon it by the president, Nana Adonko Kufwado and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. We'll bring you more news on here after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Newsnight Live on Metro TV. My name is Winston Taki. And now to a false business story. The Ghana city has depreciated by 32% against the dollar, according to the president of the Africa Investment Group, Dr. Sam Ankara. It is high time the central bank pegs the city to the dollar to stabilize the rate of depreciation of the local currency. Demand is far exceeding supply, and this issue uh, would be ongoing if proper steps have not been taken to address the issue. So what I'm suggesting is this. Stop the artificial uh, pumping of dollars into the economy. Allow the free fall for a bit. Let's get to, say, $1 to 10 cities. At that point, let's come together as a country, have a collective decision, peg the city to the dollar at that rate, for a period of while. Now, within that period, when you have pegged the city to the dollar, then you start implementing homegrown policies, in encouraging agriculture, burning or the importation of uh, rice, maize, and all these things that could be grown right here. Then you start looking at all these electronic gadgets, like the fridges and all these things have given incentives to companies to come and assemble here or produce locally. These are issues that can be done quite easily if it's looked at it critically. Stop pumping money into the market because it's not working. People have seen the intrinsic value of holding the dollar, so they it will not have any effect. Look on the other side. Let there be less interest in the dollar by pegging it and following by local policies. In that case, when the reverse is the case, you realize that the people will rather be looking for the cities rather than the dollar. Let's put value on the city. Now, let's look at, from the city depreciation, let's look at the inflation rate uh, from beginning of the year, January to August, uh, where it is now to 1.7% right on your screen. So you can see that in the month of January, we recorded an inflation rate of 12.6%, which increased to 13.9%. Somewhere in April, we recorded a figure of 19.4%, where uh, the key drivers from that moment had been the increases in petroleum prices and transport fares. Uh, those were the factors that were uh, affecting the inflationary rate. As in May, it became apparent that the import, imported inflation also was increasing by then as about 30%. But as of June, we recorded a 27.6% uh, within those period where also we saw agitation in the labor front and also the services sector uh, recording some of marginal gains there. The Upper East region in July also recorded uh, a hyperinflation. But nonetheless, we saw that in the Eastern region, which recorded the highest inflation for this season, uh, that is in, August, in July, uh, we saw the increases coming there. But so these are the figures that was recorded uh, for inflation. But the discussion then was what um, Dr. Professor Steve Hank uh, of the U.S. made mention of the fact that the recorded inflation 
is way above what the Ghana Statistical Service has recorded. So what you can see is his prediction that uh, he has said that the accurate figure of Ghana's inflation rather stands at 61.7%. 61.17%, that is what he's recorded. But the question remains that what factors did he consider in calculating his inflationary figure? So this is what he tweeted, that in Ghana, the official inflation rate has surged to a 19-year high of 31.70% per year. According to him, he said that is a fiction. It is way off. Today, I accurately measured inflation in Ghana at a sky high of 61.17%. 17%. That is 1.7 times the phony official rate. This is Steve Hank. He's a professor and he's made his accession. We'll be trying to reach him through uh, his handle and get him on Zoom probably very soon. Now, the economist Joe Jackson of Delex Finance is optimistic the current trend in rising inflation may slow down. According to him, potential drivers of inflation such as drop in crude oil prices, could help tame down inflation. The figures are heading upwards. I don't think we are out of the woods yet. I don't think we've, we've plumbed the, the issues yet. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Number one is that the price of fuel worldwide, the barrel of oil worldwide, has dropped from its heights of above 100 dollars per barrel to be to below 90 dollars so that could bring some relief through uh, a drop in fuel prices the other relief that we could get is that seasonally the harvest period has started so the harvest should bring lower prices and then again bring some relief to the to the Ghanaian public but still a lot of the issues are against us i mean the ukraine um Russia Ukraine war hasn't gone away. The, the, the challenges of our economy haven't gone away. But there is some relief ahead of us. That'll be all for business here on News Night. My name is Winston Taki. Sports is next with Phil John Corte after this break. It's 50 past 19 hours GMT in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. It's time for your sports. Let's go straight to the Spanish capital, Madrid. And focus on the opener of the Spanish La Liga. We'll bring you the fixtures of match day one before we move on to the United Kingdom and focus on the EPL. There you have it on your screens over there. Cardis will start. Uh, they will start their league title. Um, the league campaign against Real Sociedad, the Real Vallecano will take on Villarreal. Barcelona yet to register some key players to take on Vallecano. Then Santa Vigo play against Espanyol. Atletico Bilbao will take on Mallorca. Hetafe will take on Atletico Ma Madrid. Then it will be Valencia taking on Guernone. Then Real Betis will take on Elche. So there you see over there, starting 14th of August over there with the Krakow, she will be the Barcelona Real Vallecano. Let's go straight to the EPL now. There you have it. Aston Villa, Villa Park will take on Everton at St. Mary's. They will welcome Leeds United from Ellen Road. From the Kim Power Stadium comes in Leicester City. They'll go all the way to the Ghanaians who play over there. Then Brighton will be at the Amherst. They'll take on Newcastle. It will be the defending champions, Manchester City. They will play against Bournemouth. Then Liverpool, who dropped a point the last time round, will take on Crystal Palace from London. But meanwhile, Manchester United, the talk of town, they'll travel all the way to London and play against Benford. Well, in that very match, we'll talk about it later. But tomorrow, it will be time for the first derby of the league because it will be Chelsea playing against Sotima. That's your sports. My name is Phil John Corte. Showbiz is next.
Now, the first ever documentary about Big Brother Niger will premiere Saturday, August 13th, 2022. The mini documentary titled BB Niger, The Fame, The Fans, The Frenzy, produced by ID Africa's The Bank Studio, will take viewers behind the scenes of the biggest reality TV show in Africa. Africa and the world are set to witness the first ever documentary about the biggest TV reality show. The mini documentary titled BB Niger, The Fame, The Fans, The Frenzy, produced by ID Africa's The Bank Studio, will premiere on Africa Magic Showcase on Saturday, August 13, 2022. BB Niger, the fame, the fans, the frenzy will show viewers behind the scenes clips and reveal some truths about the show's production. It also tells and organizers of the show, which has grown to become the biggest Big Brother franchise in the world. It features some of the show's most popular housemates, including Messi Eke, Lei Kun, Nengi, Prince, Alex, Asogwa, Bisola Eyola, Elozonam, and Ozo. Chief Executive Officer of ID Africa, Femi Falodun, explains that the show is an African pop culture phenomenon, so it was necessary to tell its story. Well, that's it for Entertainment News. My name is Asiodua Akumia. Right? All right, Asiodua, thank you for that news right there. It's now time for the latest update on the International Front. The Mozambican government has made it unlawful to record accident or disaster scenes before notifying emergency services. The new regulations target people who take photos or videos of accidents on social media but fail to notify emergency services. Those who now fail to comply will be liable to a fine of 125 US dollars. Kenya's vote counting system has not been hacked amid a tense wait for results of Tuesday's presidential election, a top official has said. Social media has been awash with allegations that fake results have been uploaded as the count is verified. Media tallies show the two leading presidential candidates, Raila Odinga and William Ruto, are neck and neck. But it is only the Electoral Commission that can declare the winner and it has seven days to do so. Gold coins used as currency in Zimbabwe will soon be available in smaller denominations. The central bank has said skyrocketing inflation saw people rushing to cash in their Zimbabwean dollars for US dollars to stop their savings from losing value. This led to a shortage of US currency and drove up exchange rates, so the central bank reacted by halting loans. Thousands of Brazilians have taken to the streets amid concern. President Jair Bolsonaro will try to stay in power even if he loses October's elections. Protesters marched in several cities on Thursday in defense of democracy over fears the far-right leader would not respect the outcome of the vote. 